Okay, welcome. I'm Kevin Bossenmeyer. I'm a public affairs host, interviewer on KUCI Radio 88.9 FM. And on behalf of the What Matters to Me and Why organizing committee, a huge welcome. It's our eighth season. We're very proud of it, and we're delighted that you could join us today. And, and I know you're not just here for the free lunch. We are all here to experience and listen to esteemed astronomy professor, Dr. Aomawa Shields. I love her first name, Aomawa. <laughs> I'm your housekeeper today, so I have a, five items. Number one, silence your cell phones, please. Uh, we record all of our presentations, so just to make sure if you don't want to make a cameo appearance by mistake on camera, just sit behind the plane of the cameras and you'll be fine. We encourage you to complete the questionnaire that you were given when you came in. At the end of the program, we highly value your opinions and suggestions. Number three, please take out your trash at the end of the event and dispose of it outside the room. How many of you are here for the first time? Wow, fantastic. W double welcome. This speaker series is designed to give people at UCI an opportunity to hear from each other on a personal level. Each month we invite a faculty member or a staff member to give a short informal talk and to then do questions and answers. And we ask them to answer this simple question. What matters to you and why, and as authentically as possible, and to take them wherever it may lead. And as you can imagine, based on the diversity of people on this campus, the answers and approaches can literally be all over the universe. And quite often, they're inspiring and eye-opening. And upon reflection of our program, we encourage you to ask yourself the question, what matters to you and why? You might be surprised at the answers. Our speakers quite often are. We also would like to acknowledge the Office of the Chancellor and the Campus Climate Council for their unbending support of our program. We're very grateful. And we also want you to know that we're a franchise. Not only do we have our main campus, What Matters to Me and Why program, but it's also now at the medical school and through alumni relations. So if you want to know about those dates, just Google UCI What Matters to Me and Why. You can find out about those and also see uh, prior presentations that we've had for our program here. And we're all, always looking for uh, future speakers. So if you have any suggestions, please include them on your questionnaire. In, an, in a moment, Dr. Claire Yu will formally introduce Professor Aomo Shields. But as is our tradition, just we'll take one minute right now to introduce ourselves to each other. So please mingle in your seats. <laughs> And now, and now, may I introduce Dr. Claire Hugh to give our formal introduction. All right, thank you. Um, all right, so I'm going to start out with a confession. I am a Star Trek fan. And I love Star Trek, especially Next Generation. And of course, most of the time, you have these aliens on, you know, distant worlds, galaxies, well, same galaxy, far, far away. Um, and of course, we're all intrigued with the idea of extraterrestrial life, right, ET and this sort of thing. Is that really possible? Can that really happen? We know now that there are a lot of planets um, orbiting suns, stars way far away. Um, that this year's Nobel Prize was given for uh, that discovery and the technique for it. But given that we have planets way out there, can they support life? And that is the special topic that today's speaker investigates. Professor Oumuwa Shields is the Claire Booth Luce Assistant Professor in the Department of Astronomy, Physics and Astronomy. She's an astronomer and astrobiologist. And her research focuses on whether there are planets out there that can support life. She um, 
went to high school at uh, Exeter Academy in New Hampshire, very um, sort of upscale private high school, and she discovered there that she had two interests, not only astrobiology and astronomy, but she was also interested in acting. She went on to MIT where she um, received a bachelor's in Earth, Atmospheric, and Planetary Sciences, and then decided to take um, a bit of a detour and went to UCLA to uh, earn a degree in the, as a Master of Fine Arts in acting um, in 2001 from UCLA. And then after doing the acting thing for a while, she came back to the science track, uh, went to the University of Washington to obtain a PhD in astronomy and astrobiology. Uh, she, from there, became a postdoctoral fellow, uh, NSF Astronomy and Astrophysics Postdoctoral Fellowship, and a UC President's Postdoctoral Fellowship at UCLA and at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. She joined the faculty at UCI in 2017 and was awarded the prestigious NSF Career Award, which helped support her research and educational program, and her research is also supported by the NSF Habitable Worlds program. She has given a TED Talk, How We'll Find Life on Other Planets, that's garnered 1.7 million views, and she is the founder and director of the organization Rising Star Girls, which encourages girls of all colors and backgrounds to explore and discover the universe using theater, writing, and art. Please join me in welcoming Professor Shields. That was a wonderful introduction, and I love Star Trek The Next Generation, too. Um, it's my favorite of all the Star Treks. Um, it's an honor to be here today, to have been invited to participate in this series to share with uh, you a little bit about some of the things that matter to me and why. What matters to me? My husband of 15 years, my daughter, two years old this Saturday, creating an environment for her where her creamy tan skin that she has because she has an African-American mother and a Caucasian father, the combination of thin, straight, and thick, curly hair that she has on her head will be not only accepted, but celebrated by her teachers, her peers, and the community of which she is a part. Sleep matters to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm one of those people that needs eight hours of sleep per night, preferably nine. And I used to be pretty confident that I could get that amount on a regular basis and then I had a child. <laughs> and uh, sleep became elusive, like this ethereal princess whose robes descend and recede ever deeper into the dense forest as I chase her. Um, I have seen every time on a clock's face since I had my daughter. Um, 11.38, 12.05, 12.54, one oh three, two twenty six, three forty five, and so on. Um, I nurse my daughter back to sleep. I rock her. My husband rocks her more than me, trying to preserve some small fraction of the sleep that he knows I value above emeralds and consider far more essential. Without enough sleep, I become a zombie. Zombies do exist, they're called sleep-deprived mothers. <laughs> and sleep-deprived academic mothers forget about it. Um, and there are more of us on this campus than you might realize. We like to keep a low profile. Um, without enough sleep, I take exception to every single word that leaves my husband's lips. I think the world is out to get me. I usually get sick. So when there are those times when she gets sick, we all get sick, she has a nightmare. A couple of weeks ago she had a nightmare about um, a bicycle, a really scary bicycle. And we scoured every nook and cranny of her bedroom uh, in a big way, trying to point out that there was no scary bicycle. We would look under the crib, is there a bicycle there? Nope, no bicycle. Is it under your chest of drawers? No, no bicycle. In the closet, no bicycle. 
And she would giggle, and you could see the memory of the scary bicycle fading a little bit more with each passing moment, but it wouldn't be for another three and a half hours before we were able to get her to back to sleep for any length of time. So when sleep becomes disrupted, I revert back to the basics, and I take uh, to heart that old adage, sleep when the baby sleeps. I don't catch up on work. I don't try to do housework. I sleep when she sleeps. I sleep when she doesn't sleep, if I can. Uh, if she's at daycare and I can cancel a meeting or two, if it's the weekend and my husband's watching her or a sitter, I know that when I get enough sleep, I am a better person, both at work and at home. And so I prioritize what I think is the most important aspect of that often used term, self-care. Education and perseverance matter to me. So I grew up for a time in La Jolla, California, um, and I remember being dragged along to my mother's grad school seminars while she was getting her MA and PhD in music theory and composition um, at UC San Diego. So I would sit in these seminars. Uh, her specialty was called atonal music, which is music that pushes against and often exceeds the boundaries of the traditional 12-tone scale. So from my limited perspective, it was music that there was no verse or chorus or bridge or melody. I couldn't tell where it started, where the middle was, where it ended. And with the exception of one time when I was asked to actually participate and my role was to eat Doritos at particular moments during, during a piece and the conductor would say, and I would go. <laughs> that was fun, that was a fun time. But every other seminar I was bored out of my mind and so I would fall asleep. My head curled up on one chair, feet on a joining chair, um, like a little cat. And this was all well and good until I started to snore. <laughs> um, and even in these sort of novel environments of atonal music, snoring is considered a disruption. So, um, <laughs> so my mom likes to say that I uh, kept those very arrogant guest artists in these seminars humble. Because no matter how awesome they thought their atonal avant-garde music was, somewhere in the audience was a six-year-old snoring loudly at their selections. Um, and you know, my mom got her PhD and she took 12 years because she had me and my brother along the way. We moved several times across the US and Canada for teaching positions when she was ABD, for teaching positions for my stepfather, for a faculty position at Hampshire College, which she held for over 20 years. And all the while, she continued to write music on this drafting table with this sort of architecture ruler, I remember, that she would use to make staffs and notes and to separate measures to get down on paper the music that was dancing in her head long after she'd read a bedtime story to me and kissed me goodnight and tucked me into bed. My grandmother majored in math at Tennessee State University in the 1930s. So let that sink in. African-American woman majoring in mathematics in the South in the 1930s. She was never called on. She raised chickens to put herself through school. And one day the chickens escaped and there went her college career. But she never gave up. I remember as a kid, there were this, this stack of textbooks on her bedside table, accounting textbooks, math textbooks, she was taking night school classes for a while. She worked with numbers at, as a civil servant at Miramar Air Force Base. She was always trying, trying to get back. So as a kid, we used to go to those Blue Angels flight shows at Miramar, and people would caravan long rows of cars full of picnic blankets and coolers, just like a football game. But we would lay on those blankets and look up at the sky and watch these planes do these incredible death-defying acts, flying in intricate formations, coming within mere yards of each other to make bow ties and diamonds in the sky. Miramar was also the home of the original Top Gun fighter pilot training school, which uh, inspired the movie Top Gun. And so I remember watching that movie, and <laughs> I couldn't get over it when Kelly McGillis' character, Charlotte Blackwood, call sign Charlie, was introduced for the first time for who she really was. And this was the day after that bar scene where Tom Cruise hits on her and you think she's just some random chick. Well, the next day she gets introduced and she's walking down the aisle 
between these two groups of fighter pilots in their jumpsuits, and she's wearing her sheer black pantyhose and pumps, and Michael Ironside says in his gravelly voice, she is a civilian contractor, and she has a PhD in astrophysics. You do not salute her. And <laughs> Charlie whips her head around, and you see these aviators with the mirrored lenses and her curly blonde hair catching the sunlight. And I remember thinking, hell yeah, astrophysics, <laughs> sign me up. I want that, she is badass. Um, <laughs> Uh, I also grew up in the shadow of uh, the Challenger disaster, so also that same year that Top Gun came out um, in 1986. And I remember walking into my fifth grade classroom and seeing my teacher's tear-stained face. And even in my limited um, ability to understand that moment, I knew that something had gone horribly wrong. Um, but I wasn't deterred when a couple years later I saw yet another movie that um, romanticized space, uh, space camp, um, not an Oscar contender, but <laughs> I loved it and decided that's what I wanted to do. Um, get that PhD in astrophysics, go to space. I uh, went to Exeter, Phillips Exeter Academy, because it had its own observatory. And uh, yet, along the way, I auditioned for a play. And uh, the Exeter was mounting a production of Steel Magnolias. And every single girl on campus wanted a role in that play, um, except me. I actually tagged along with some girls who were like, come on, audition, audition. I was like, all right, whatever. Um, and I didn't want to get cast, so of course I got cast. Um, and you know, it's no surprise that that would open this whole new world for me of, of the arts. Um, I, I'm the daughter of two professional musicians. Um, who had a band in college called the Pyramids and traveled the world playing music. Um, as I speak, they are traveling the world in the Pyramids playing music. Um, I can literally say the band is back together again. Um, and they're not married, they haven't been married for 40 something years, but they uh, came back together over their love of music. Um, they're recording an album right now in London. So um, arts uh, is in my blood. I, I've been shown pictures of um, me in my mom's belly as she's playing flute with my dad playing saxophone and she's dancing in these incredible robes and you see this protruding belly and there I am. Um, so it was no surprise, or at least it shouldn't have been. Um, I ended up, one play led to another and I was on the dramat board deciding which productions were going to be mounted at Exeter, acting in half of them. I proctored at the observatory, I uh, pitched on the varsity softball team, and I uh, played violin in the chamber orchestra. And then I would get up at 4 a.m. on cold February nights and measured the period of Jupiter's moons, um, the observatory, just sipping cocoa while I'd stare up into the cold black night and um, you know, this, the blanket of snow would reflect um, the, the bright moon and make it seem like it was almost day and I loved it. And it felt like I could do everything at Exeter, whatever I wanted. But when it came time to apply for colleges, I sort of got the impression I had to choose one thing and pick the school that was the best in that thing. And so I chose astronomy and MIT. And it wasn't always a picnic. Um, sometimes I did well, sometimes it was challenging. And yet again, I was faced with a crossroads in my senior year where I had, was sort of starved for some kind of creative expression, so I had started taking acting classes at MIT. So it became, do I go to acting grad school or astronomy grad school? And again, astronomy won. But that was the last time for a while that astronomy won. Um, I started a PhD program in astrophysics at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, but I was distracted. I kept daydreaming, and in one of my most memorable daydreams, um, I'd been nom nominated for an Oscar um, for my role as Zora Neale Hurston um, in the biopic. I won the Oscar. I gave a heart-stopping, tear-inducing speech dressed in a gown of crystal bronze etching. Um, over transparent muslin that escaped even the harshest scrutiny on the E! Entertainment Network. <laughs> um, so my heart was not, excuse me, my heart was not in astronomy um, at the time, and so my brain followed. I got, was unfocused, started doing poorly, isolated, living alone in an upstairs two-bedroom half of a house on a deserted street in Madison, Wisconsin, neck deep in snow, while my classmates all lived in the same house together. I, uh, 
stood in my professor's office, my professor of the course Basic Astrophysics, which is kind of a contradiction in terms. Nothing basic about <laughs> astrophysics. <laughs> but uh, he told me to consider other career options. He was an old white man with a few thin wisps of hair erupting from the top of his head. And he surveyed me through glasses with half inch thick lenses and he drew his conclusion. <clears throat> and I sat in his office and cried. And then I plotted my escape. I applied to grad schools and acting again. I rode secret buses to Chicago to audition. And then I ran away to one of them and never looked back. Acting grad school felt like playtime at first compared to astrophysics grad school. <laughs> That's not to say that it wasn't hard, because it was. It was just hard in a different way. Um, I was so used to thinking and analyzing and enacting, that's the obstacle. You're supposed to feel and have your feelings right under the surface for easy access. So my scientist brain that, that was always considering and having to have all the I's dotted and T's crossed had to take a back seat for a while. Um, I remember in one of my method acting classes, we had to do a exercise called the private moment where we were supposed to do two activities that we wouldn't mind if someone walked in on us doing and one activity that we'd be mortified if someone walked in on us doing. So one of my benign activities was flossing my teeth. I sort of did that in a make-believe mirror. And then the embarrassing activity was I sang my lungs out to the song Glory from my favorite musical, Rent. And I remember my method acting teacher saying at the end of my private moment, you almost got there. You almost went 100%. We were all cheering for you. We wanted you to go for it. You came so close. But I think I did pretty well for a recovering scientist. So. <laughs> and the whole point of the private moment was really to get us to be vulnerable, to let ourselves have our walls down so that an audience could you know, walk into the souls of a character and see that character's soul raw and unfiltered and be forever changed by that intimacy. I was able to portray many characters as a professional actor, both on stage and on screen, but I found that the character I was most interested in portraying was myself. Um, and that character, me, missed the sky above my head. I had forgotten to look up amidst the traffic jams and temp jobs to pay the rent, the auditions and occasional successes and small movements forward. So when I did finally look up, I would see one or two stars in the gray night over a smoggy city, but that was enough to wake up my heart. So I found my way back again. I actually applied to grad schools again in astronomy, reached out to an advisor from undergrad, got encouragement and support, and got accepted into the University of Washington's PhD program in astronomy and astrobiology. But I learned that that was only half the battle, finding my way back again. Um, the mind is a powerful thing. And I had internalized a lot of those early comments, like from that old white professor. And it took me a decade or more to shift and reframe my thinking around that. Um, it doesn't really matter why he said those comments, whether they came from a malevolent place or not. What mattered was, I needed to let go of that resentment because it was only hurting me, not him. So I found a way to view it in a positive way, which is that I actually, because of that change, the action, doing something totally different with this acting path, I got to give myself permission to step off the tightrope that I had put myself on at age 12. You know, I have to do this and this and this and this and it'll get here. And once I did that, I was off the tightrope. I saw that there was a big wide world with so many options. By the time I came back to astronomy, I really knew that I wanted to be there. It wasn't an automatic, you do this, that's what you do, go to grad school. It was, I want this. I was an older student, so I really had to want it bad to leave a very well-paying job working in support of the Spitzer Space Telescope, scheduling observations. Um, I really had to want that change. And by the time I came back, I knew what I wanted to study. These planets orbiting stars other than the sun, exoplanets, this field had exploded in the decade that I was gone. And I didn't just want to find them planets. I knew that finding them was only the first step. I wanted to figure out how we can tell what the planets are like. How can we tell which planets might have life on them? 
But the acting background that I had sort of sparked a seed. I felt so that these, um, this training was so personal. It dawned on me that I could use that, that acting and the creative arts, which are inherently personal by definition, as a gateway to help perhaps young girls of color who don't have the role models that they need to build a connection between themselves and that star in the sky that they learn about so that they could say, look, I know that star, that star is mine. I wrote a poem about it. And that hopefully they could stay connected to that star or that planet or that galaxy even as they encounter obstacles, which of course they will. So one of my obstacles as a graduate student in astronomy was giving science talks. So I'm a classically trained actor, so um, giving the talk was not the problem. Being up in front of people was not the problem. What was the problem was the Q&A portion after, where the audience could actually talk back to me. Because in the world of theater, there is something called a fourth wall. This invisible line between what we're all doing up here and what the audience is doing. And the audience does not cross that invisible line unless they're invited. But in science, there is no fourth wall. People ask questions after the talk, during the talk, sometimes before the talk. <laughs> Um, and they felt when I was new like they were flying at me and I didn't know what to do. I became a deer in the headlights. I would often blurt out things even though I wasn't even sure if they were right. So I went to a professor in my department and a white man, um, esteemed, renowned, and encouraging and supportive of inclusive astronomy spaces long before the term ally was fashionable. And I shared my plight with him and he said, some great advice I've never forgotten. You always have a few moments between the question being asked and your answer. Take that time to consider what you want to say. Then you can share your thoughts. If you don't have thoughts to share, say, I'll look into it and get back to you. And when I started to implement this approach, of course it was clunky at first, but eventually it began to be second nature. And I am blessed to be able to mentor my students who often express that fear and anxiety over giving talks and answering questions. And I tell them, when people ask questions, it's a good thing. That means they're interested in what you've done and what you've shared. If you've ever been at a talk where you get no questions, that's devastating because you're the person speaking who has the questions. You know, did I talk too long? Do people just want to get out of here? Do they not understand what I'm saying? But when people ask questions, it means that they were paying attention. It's a dialogue. They want to engage with you. And I tell them, rarely are questions combative. Um, it does happen, but it's rare. And I tell them how to deal with those, too. I tell them, make no mistake, a science talk is a performance. What kind of story do you want to tell? How do you want to draw your audience's attention to those points that you've presented to that story? So that they can, again, reframe their thinking and their perspective from feeling victimized to feeling empowered. So the difference maker for me the second time around in astronomy grad school was that I asked for help. So I like to say that I had all sorts of feelings um, when I came back, you know, the fear, the anxiety, the, did I have what it takes? Students in the audience, if you think you're the only ones who feel those feelings, <laughs> um, think again. All of your professors have had those feelings from one time or another. I certainly have. Um, it's what I do with the feelings that matters. The feelings themselves don't matter. They pass, they shift, they move like clouds in a windy sky. But what I do with them matters. Do I let them paralyze me, make me quit? Or do I let them empower me to go find the help I need to get what I want? And the second time around, I used those feelings to catapult me into seeking help. And I had support groups <laughs> up the wazoo from all different um, areas and corners of the country. Um, I have in the past shared slides and talks where I put all my mentors on a slide and they don't fit anymore, their headshots. I have so many. My mentorship community is strong and wide and diverse. I tell people that science is not um, an individual game, it's a team sport. It's not a solo performance. So something else, this sort of getting help. I have not only gotten help from actual people, um, but from a power greater than myself, which I believe and which I choose to call God. 
and I find no conflict between spirituality and science. In fact, Carl Sagan himself said that science is not only compatible with spirituality, it is a profound source of spirituality. And the notion that science and spirituality are somehow mutually exclusive does a disservice to both. Those are his words. I'm not a religious person, but I am a spiritual person. And I've heard it said that I can choose to believe in God and, um, and look for evidence to support that, or I can choose not to believe in God and look for evidence to support that. Because I will find it in both scenarios. So today I choose to believe in God and look for evidence to support that. And when I have looked for that evidence, I found it. I found it when I thought that I had to choose between science and acting because there's no way that they could coexist, that I could find a job where they could coexist. And then I was shown that I could do science television. And I could never have planned that myself. Didn't even fathom that that would be an option for me. Then I hosted a science TV show and another one and another one. And I know that's in my future again. Um, my higher power is not limited by my lack of imagination. And it's very important for me to believe in that because when I do, um, I find humility. I see myself right-sized and my true place to compare to a higher power and my fellow human beings. I will never be a professor who tells another student they shouldn't be in my career or any career. I'm not that powerful. I can't tell the future. I can't tell if someone should or shouldn't be an astronomer or an engineer or a pianist. That's not my job and it's not my role. What I can do is tell a person, how badly do you want it? How much do you love it? Because loving something doesn't mean you're going to be good at it. Loving something means you're willing to work as hard as you need to work to get good at it. And if you work hard, you'll get better. You may even get good. So that's what I mean by being able to trust that other people and their own higher powers can work out whether they should or shouldn't be in a career. But what I can do is offer encouragement and support um, for whatever they choose to pursue. Um, it's also important for me to, because I listen to my higher power and I get direction when I listen, and often I'm told, stop, slow down, <laughs> don't just do, because I am a doer. I'm, I, and doing has gotten me very far in life, but it also can cheat me out of living in the here and now. And I'm someone that people have to say, don't just do something, sit there. Um, just sit in a room and watch yourself breathe. And so I do as much as I can uh, with my students and my courses that I teach and also my research group meetings. I actually have, I start every um, session with three to five minutes of secular mindfulness-based meditation where we just sit still and we watch our breath in and out and the mind swirls over our head as it's supposed to do and as many times as necessary we bring our mind back to the breath, focus back to the breath. And I do this for them so that they know that the only moment that we can guarantee that we have is this one. This is the only moment that we have probability of one that we're going to have. And I do it for myself so that I remember that this is the only moment that I have. This moment when my daughter calls to me across the room, come on mommy, play city. You know? And that is the most important moment of my life. I'm so glad I did not get chosen to be an astronaut. And I tried three times, was never selected to make it to the next round. And I'm so grateful as much as I love the universe and space and the idea of traveling and setting foot for the first time on one of these worlds that I model with computers, I would miss out on so much. My daughter, my, the, my husband, the time I have with them, I don't want to miss a single moment. I'd miss out on the egg colored moon that I was privileged to be able to be in my right mind enough to stop and look at and say, oh my God, it's so gorgeous last night through the foggy sky. I'm so glad I didn't miss that moon. So I focus on the breath, on this present moment so that I can slow myself down. I can remember this is all the time that I have right now. And it's not only all the time I have, it's the most important time that I have. Will you do it with me? Okay, those who would like to, I invite you to close your eyes. Let your feet be flat on the floor, palms face down on tops of your thighs. And take a deep breath, perhaps the deepest breath you've taken all day, in through the nose. 
and sigh it out through the mouth. Notice where your body makes contact with the chair or the floor. Wiggle your fingers and toes. And when you're ready, you can open your eyes. Thank you. Thank you very much for an excellent talk. Um, we have time for some questions. Uh, if you'd like to, please raise your hand. And we have some people with microphones who uh, will give you a microphone so it can be uh, recorded. Why did you choose UCI? Oh, great question. You know, I, um, I, Doug Haynes <laughs> was the first thing that came to mind. <laughs> um, he was someone that I'd met through the UC President's Postdoc program, and he had said, you should come and give a talk at UCI, and so he helped me set that up, and then uh, behind the scenes, he was kind of working his magic, and then all of a sudden, a colloquium talk turned into, come back for a job talk, and I was like, whoa, no, no, no. Um, <laughs> And then I came here and, and it was beautiful. I love how close UCI is to the ocean and the beach and the ocean is really important to me. In LA, when I, where I lived, I have to drive 45 minutes to it. Here it's 15 minutes. Um, it felt like there were things that uh, were changing in a positive way at UCI. It's fairly young and I liked that aspect. Um, I like that UCI has an institutional membership to the National Center for Faculty Development and Diversity because I had started to, I did their faculty success program as a postdoc and I loved all their webinar, um, uh, their resources and I knew I'd be able to access those um, without additional cost here. Um, and I felt like the department was interested and excited to, to open its door to exoplanets. They really wanted to start and, and create a field um, of exoplanets in the department. I was the first person, and now I have a colleague, Paul Robertson, and we have someone else, Steph Salem, coming. Um, and so to be the pioneer in that way in the department was very exciting too, uh, and I love Southern California. Other questions? Yeah, there's a hand up there, the uh, second row. Could you tell us more about your Rising Star Girls program? Yes, thank you for asking. Um, so I started the, this program when I was still a postdoc. I had, uh, it was before I got selected as a TED Fellow, um, and as I was applying, even in grad school, I was applying for postdocs, and my broader impacts component to the NSF postdoc fellowship was um, to create an astronomy um, workshop that used theater and writing and visual art. I wanted to use this non-traditional acting background that I had in a way that would complement um, the sciences and astronomy. So when I got selected to do that, that was kind of the, the um, core piece was this workshop. And I kind of took that around to different schools and after school programs in Southern California and also at, in Cambridge, Massachusetts as a one woman show, so to speak. <laughs> and then um, at sometime in the postdoc years, I thought about the name for it. And I thought Rising Star Girls because <laughs> Um, my mom actually has always called me her star girl. Uh, and so I combined the two, the, the, this idea that these girls are rising, you know, that, that the hope is that we will lure them into astronomy and that they'll stay there. Um, and that as their middle school is often the age, it's been shown in literature where girls start to get quiet, they raise their hands less often, they become more concerned with how they look and less concerned with what's in their minds and hearts. Um, and so that's why it's middle school, middle school girl age, ages 10 to 14 thereabouts, that I target. Because that's, it's been shown that that's the age, it's a turning point. Um, and you we want the girls to not get quiet, we want them to get loud, to ask the questions, no matter whether they know the answers or not, um, to not be afraid to not know the answer. So um, that's why I chose that group. And, uh, and the title, and so now we're not just um, going around to do workshops in the immediate areas of our communities, but we're actually, with the NSF Career Award, we're able to put Rising Star Girls on a global platform so that we're conducting, we just conducted the first webinar for educators, 10 educators across the US, Spain, Germany, and Pakistan tuned in. At the end of September, we had that webinar, and I just showed them how to use the curriculum, and the hope is that 
because we have a curriculum. We, have, we actually have a handbook that's downloadable for free on risingstargirls.org. You can go to the website and read more about it. And you can download the handbook and use the activities in whatever way as an educator would work for, for the girls in your communities. And so we have a built-in incentives to help these educators uh, implement the curriculum and we have kind of follow-up if they do so. They get to have a webinar with my research group and um, exclusively and so the hope is that we're really maximizing the impact globally of this program. Other questions? You gave us a sense of the roles, the labels that you live with, that you work with. Have you felt any understanding, like right now, what is yours to do? My work? So there's, there are many things. <laughs> um, I've got the research side of myself, which has goals and you know my team is working on many different projects uh, we're looking at how the frat we've already looked at how the fraction of land on a planet could determine its climate how the shape of a planet's orbit can impact its ability to be warm enough for surface liquid water uh, throughout its year um, how different surface compositions can impact climate and habitability and we're looking towards the next projects um, the education part of me wants to really get a hold of as many educators as possible and have them really, I, I have this dream of having all over the world people doing these Rising Star Girls activities where it's not just uh, conveying information out of a textbook but saying, okay, you learned just now about why galaxies form, let's write a song about it. You know, um, let's write a, a PSA for um, the planet you think we should go to to look for life first. Um, and then, uh, you know, I have my own personal projects uh, at some point. Uh, I think it would be nice to share my story more broadly. Um, but I think what's, what's helped me is to kind of, um, kind of ask again, uh, in concert with this power greater than myself that kind of directs me, what's, what should I do next? And usually when I ask that question, I'm shown the next indicated thing, the next indicated thing. And it just kind of reveals itself. And then I just show up. And that's my job. Other questions? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I had a, quite a, a, a kind of suspicion that there is a kind of relation between creativity in space and creativity in humans. I don't know if you thought about it. Creativity uh, has, is a much broader term than I think I once thought. In my mind, it was creativity is only the science, the, 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 huma, the, the arts and humanities and, and disciplines that, um, for which there is no right or wrong. Um, but scientists have to be extraordinarily creative. Um, that's, creativity is inherent to, to the discipline of, and study of science. Um, I was drawn to the, the way that I, uh, selected my own dissertation topic was I actually saw the contradiction that I sometimes felt over the years between the science part of me that I often felt like an actor when I was around scientists and a scientist when I was around actors and always dancing that edge. And I found that contradiction um, in a particular principle that someone presented a paper about how ice uh, has a different reflectivity depending on the type of light that ice receives from the host star. And I thought, that's very contradictory. Light absorbs this amount of this type of light and reflects this type of light. So the way it can manifest in climate will depend on the host star. And that little seed made an entire dissertation for me, kind of following up on that. Um, so that was very creative, I, if I do say so myself, <laughs> because uh, it, that, had, that hadn't existed before, um, the road to, to how to form your dissertation. You know, and I hadn't found that light bulb, that thing that made me want to get up in the morning and keep working on, which you need in grad school because it's a marathon, not a sprint. Um, and so I was able to find that by kind of finding a, a parallel between my own personal life and, me, and what I was seeing um, manifested physically um, in the science literature. So yes, I think science and creativity, to, to go to space, you have to be darn well creative. I mean, that's how we were able to get up there the first time. Um, be able to put a man in space and successive 
men and women in space, um, and that's how I think we'll be able to do it again and go to Mars next and hopefully beyond, is we have to be very creative, especially when it comes to spacecraft propulsion, which is ultimately what limits our ability to, to get to those uh, exoplanets as in our lifetime. We just can't get there fast enough yet, but people are working on that and very creative methods are being employed, I'm sure. Other questions? Yes, here. Uh, wait for the microphone. She's, she's oh, yeah. Okay. Hi. Um, so, do you still do anything with acting uh, alongside with um, uh, your grad or your studies and uh, like besides Rising Star Girls? I'm just curious if you still have that creative outlet with you. You know, I, there hasn't been a lot of time. Um, I've been focused a lot on the research aspect, and then and then the Rising Star Girls is the small educational piece that that I spend some time on. The closest I've gotten is the TED Talk. So when I got selected to be a TED Fellow, I was excited because I was like, oh, I get to give a TED Talk. And you know, it, it, it was televised and it, you know, it, it felt very much like acting had once felt, um, except for it was me up there telling my story in uh, five minutes. Um, but uh, my husband, I met him in acting grad school. And so he is 100% actor through and through. <laughs> um, so I'm you know, half and half or 70, 30 or, you know, um, but uh, he, he's the one who does a lot of the acting and I hope at some point to do something. Uh, there are times when I think, oh, it'd be great to be able to do a play, um, but uh, for the time I have to, one of the things that um, I'm very glad that I have chosen and focused, um, so I, Natalie Goldberg is someone who's a writing teacher that has inspired me and I, uh, over the years, and she writes about, you know, choosing one thing and going deeply with it so that you know what it's like to go 100%. Um, and when I finally did that, and I did that with astronomy that, that second time around, I was like, okay, I'm putting acting on hold because this is important to me. I need this PhD. I want it. Um, and it was hard to, for me to do that sort of jack of all trades, master of none mentality was sort of inherent to me. But when I did focus in, I did well. Um, it was when I was all over the place and wanting to do this and that, that I was scattered. But imagine all of that mental energy focused on one thing. Um, in my experience, that, that's very powerful. So I focused on that. And maybe another, another chapter will focus on acting. But for right now, it's really um, you know, doing astronomy, research, mentoring students, and um, being able to also uh, run the Rising Star Girls program. Thank you. Um, just wanted to ask, um, what advice would you give your younger self in um, seeing yourself from now and seeing how you've succeeded in um, the astro astronomy department and going into art and having that like dual experience and seeing that you didn't think that you could have that before? What would you say to your younger self about that? Yeah, thank you for asking that question. Um, so a mentor in grad school the second time around for astronomy <laughs> told me to view my theater background as my superpower. And that was a game changer for me because before that moment, I thought I had to sweep it under the rug and to be taken seriously as a scientist. But when I saw it as an advantage that actually made me a much more diverse and um, uh, scientist and the, with the ability to communicate my, uh, what I studied on a broader level, um, that you know, that meant the world. And so I think if I could look back and my younger self that agonized about this, you know, I need to choose, I need to choose, da, 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 um, I would say, you know, relax. <laughs> um, and how can you, again, the reframing, how can you see who you are and accept it? You know, I'm always gonna be that hyphen, scientist, actor, actor, scientist, you know, or writer, scientist, you know, and so many of us are. Very few people are actually one thing only. Um, seeing that multifaceted nature and how it can benefit um, and actually complement and make us more effective um, in our chosen career, that's what I would have liked to have known earlier on. Um, and of course, the neuroses and you know, the fears, I think I would have just said, you know, calm down, you're good. Um, just you know, do the footwork, get the help you need. Um, eventually I did it, but I think I would have liked to have done it earlier. Well, please join me in thanking Professor Shields. Thank you so much.